who is, who is a researcher at CNRS and he has in Paris and he's also working part-time for the Computer Science Institute of Charles University in Prague and at the Combinatoric Center of Zhejiang Normal University in China. He works a lot on combinatorics, especially Patrice together with Yaroslav Neshetril invented the notions of nowhere denseness and bounded expansion and developed the resulting theory of sparsity and he will now speak about this very influential and great work um, with a talk titled The Local Properties of Sparse Graphs. Please, Patrice, the stage is yours. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for, this, uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak uh, uh, in this audience. But uh, uh, so uh, I will, my talk somehow will will have two aspects, uh, a short uh, overview of, uh, of the notion of sparsity and, uh, and of the tools, of some tools that we use. It will be quite short. And, uh, and then I will uh, try to take uh, time to, uh, for a case study, so for a, a specific problem and to see how the tools from sparsity can help in the context of uh, distributed uh, computing. So let me start with some uh, very uh, basic uh, uh, definitions. Uh, and uh, I think that in the beginning, I will not, uh, will not learn anything, but uh, just to, to recall some, uh, uh, some basic definitions. So uh, the, first, the first definition is the definition of the local, mod local model. So we consider uh, some fixed network. And uh, <clears throat> what, is, what is interesting in this, in this model is that uh, the network, the, the, uh, 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 this communication network that we use is also the input graph of the problem. So this network has uh, N, uh, N nodes. And these nodes are supposed to be uh, super powerful, uh, infinitely powerful uh, uh, computers that can uh, compute whatever you ask in, uh, in, uh, in no time. Um, and these nodes possess some uh, unique ID. Uh, there are two possible, uh, uh, two possible models, one where you have unique ID, one where you have uh, some random string. But I will assume that you have some unique ID, and this ID is short. Basically, it has uh, some size, which is uh, uh, some constant time log n. Um, in, uh, in this network, the, the computation will use some, uh, uh, OK, will be performed at, uh, at the nodes, and will use some communication over the, uh, the edges, uh, the links of the network. And, uh, and the running time will basically be uh, counted as a number of rounds of communication round, because uh, we will assume that you have some uh, synchronous uh, message passing model. Uh, moreover, it is kind of standard to assume that every node knows the number of, uh, of vertices of the network, or at least have some estimate of this number. OK. Um, this local model is very, 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 very powerful, but uh, sometimes you want to have some model which would be a bit more constrained. <clears throat> and uh, such uh, a more constrained model is a congest model. So the, in the congest model, um, you cannot send messages of, uh, in any size. In the local model, you can send uh, messages of, uh, of any, given, uh, any size you want. Actually, uh, you never need more than uh, somehow polynomial in N. But in the congest model, you cannot send messages of size more than uh, roughly log N. And, uh, and a second possible uh, strengthening of the model is to uh, is, is a congest broadcast model, where every vertex uh, has to send the same message to all its neighbors. But of course, uh, uh, you, you can send only a uh, so few type of messages if you send messages to, uh, the same message to all your neighbors, but you can receive simultaneously uh, messages from all your neighbors. So uh, you, you don't have a bound on the number of messages that you can receive 
in one round, only on what you can send in one round. So when you have a network, and uh, so as I, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, some interesting points in the model is that uh, your input graph is your network. But just for the theory, you can, uh, you can think about the case where uh, actually your input graph is not the same as the network, but that uh, somehow your input graph is emulated in your network. So you have an, a communication network and uh, every uh, vertex of your input graph correspond to some node in your network and every edge of your graph is uh, is routed you have some uh, routing algorithm and is routed as a short pass in your network and moreover uh, in the congest model you will ask that uh, uh, not only you have short pass to route every edge but that every link of your network belongs to a bounded number of paths and sometimes it will be uh, it will be interesting to consider some uh, some communication network that is not your input graph because uh, it will allow to have some direct links to uh, for instance to uh, to nodes that you could not reach directly in the input graph uh, or to the opposite uh, you could have some uh, less uh, communication links uh, but uh, allowing you, you to uh, uh, to have more uh, structure and you can even go a, okay one step further and say okay let's go back to the case where my network is the same as my input graph but maybe what i can do is that in my on my input graph g which is also my communication network i can emulate a new communication network that will be better for me and solve on this new communication network my problem which corresponds to my graph it may look a bit strange, but it is uh, it is a strategy that we will use because it will allow us to uh, to consider some uh, uh, to work on a graph which contain possibly more edges or more connectivity than the input graph. So we will decompose the problem into two steps. First, uh, build some uh, uh, communication networks that we emulate on G, and then on this uh, on this communication network we can solve the problem more easily. Of course, it's not always clear what kind of communication network we should emulate, if it should be uh, denser to have more communication or sparser to have more structural properties. So what does it mean that we route somehow uh, this notion of routing uh, uh, that we emulate a graph in another graph? Um, Basically, it means that uh, every edge can be used by uh, a bounded number of paths, and, uh, and the, the paths corresponding to the edges of the new, uh, new graph will have bounded size. And you can, uh, you can see that, uh, in some sense, you can view the situation as, uh, as follows. You have your graph, which is uh, here a T, and uh, you take some lexicographic product with some uh, small click, which means somehow that you blow uh, every node into a bounded number of nodes uh, and, uh, and every edge is blown into a, a bounded uh, by click. And every edge of the graph that you want to, uh, to emulate will be a short pass in this lexicographic product. So for instance, the edge from this point to this point, well, it may be strange, but it will go this way. It can, it, uh, edges can be uh, routed in a, in a strange way. Uh, this is not completely optimal, but uh, but for the theory, it will be uh, it will be interesting to have uh, sometimes some non-optimal, uh, uh, completely optimal routing. Okay, so what are sparse networks? So um, we have seen that the notion of routing that we want to use is based on the no this notion of uh, of uh, shallow topological minor. What what means shallow topological minor? We have a graph H, and a graph H is a shallow topological minor of a graph G at depth t. If basically I can emulate my graph H in G by assigning to every vertex of H some vertex of G, 
and routing every age, age of H as a short pass in G in such a way that the short paths do not intersect. So, uh, of course, if I want to, uh, to really uh, uh, construct some uh, uh, distributed algorithm, it's not sufficient to simply uh, have this, uh, this uh, embedding. I should also be, um, should also have some uh, uh, distributed routing algorithm. Uh, but the minimum is that I have this property. So when H is, uh, is a shallow topological minor of a graph G adapts T, I will simply denote uh, H belongs to, uh, to this set. So G nabla tilde T will mean the set of all shallow topological minors of my graph G adapts at most T. And if I consider a class of graphs instead of a single graph, I will do, denote by C nabla tilde T the set of shallow topological minors of all the graphs at depth t of all the graphs in my class. And now I have sufficiently many definitions to, to define the notion of bonded expansion and nowhere dense. Uh, what is interesting with this notion is that uh, you have a, a huge number of uh, characterizations which are not completely obviously equivalent and, uh, and so you can use uh, almost uh, any of them as a definition, uh, depending on the, uh, on the context uh, where you, that you consider. So here, I will say that a class has bonded expansion. If when I look at a shallow topological minor of a graph uh, in my class at depth r, its average degree will be bonded by some function of r and not depending on the graph. So my function is given once for all for my class. And uh, the definition of a nowhere dense class is very similar, except that instead of bonding the average degree, I bond the clique number. So let me give some examples. Uh, consider the class of planar graphs. If I consider any shallow topological minor, of, uh, of a planar graph, this shallow topological minor is also planar. So its bonded degree, its, uh, its uh, average degree is bonded by six, by Euler formula. So every planar graph, uh, the class of planar graphs has bonded expansion. Similarly, uh, of course, every class with bonded degree has bonded expansion as uh, the shallow topological minors will also have bonded degree. Uh, if I have a class which excludes a minor, it will have bonded expansion. If it excludes a topological minor, it will have bonded expansion. And, uh, and you have uh, actually a bit more. Uh, for instance, if I have a class, if C is a class with bonded expansion, and if I take the lexicographic product of the graph in my class by a small complete graph, then this new class still has bonded expansion. So you see that uh, now we have the two ingredients for this bonded expansion, this, uh, this stability by a small lexicographic product and by taking some uh, shallow topological minors, which means that uh, the two ingredients that we uh, introduced for the notion of emulation of a network in another network uh, are somehow uh, naturally related to the notion of bonded expansion. Um, no dense classes, uh, are still sparse, but, uh, but a, a nowhere dense class does not need to have a bonded average degree. Um, a typical example of a nowhere dense class that, is, uh, that does not have bonded expansion, and that does not even have bonded average degree, is a class of graphs where the maximum degree is bonded by a function, for instance, is bonded by the girth. It says that the maximum degree is less or equal than the girth that is the size of the minimum size of a cycle in my graph. Then, uh, of course, if I have a, uh, if I consider a topological uh, minor adepts R, if it is a clique, it means uh, that I have a cycle uh, in G which has length uh, three times R plus one. It is my uh, given by my three pass uh, of a triangle of my clique. So it means that my graph G 
as girls at most three r plus uh, r plus three so it has maximum degree at most three r plus three so my clique cannot have uh, more than three r plus four vertices so the, the clique size is bonded by the depth of my shallow topological minor so now the world now looks like this you have uh, our almost all the standard classes that we like so this is a, a very nice picture by felix heidel that i could not uh, uh, avoid to show and uh, and all the, the standard classes that we study in the sparse context uh, like a bonded genus excluding minor excluding a topological minor or even excluding locally locally excluding a minor uh, find some place in this hierarchy. So here it is uh, uh, on the left you have uh, bonded expansion classes and uh, on the right you have this, uh, um, on the top you have nowhere dense which cover all this notion including bonded expansion and local version of bonded expansion. So now that we, that we have the theory that we have basically the definition uh, what are these uh, classes with bonded expansion or what are these nowhere dense classes good for? One point which is interesting is that uh, uh, there are some problems that are easy on classes with bonded expansion or in nowhere dense classes and which are difficult in general. For instance, um, checking whether some first order formula is satisfied is a fixed parameter tractable on nowhere dense classes. It can be done in almost linear time, but it is difficult. Uh, but on on a monotone class where that is not um, nowhere dense, it is as difficult as on general graphs. So and uh, and believe not to be fixed parameter tractable. And um, many problems which are uh, also related to local properties. Uh, like uh, domination, uh, distance D domination, or things like this, uh, are, have, uh, have nice algorithms or nice approximation algorithms uh, in bonded expansion class in nowhere dense classes. And these algorithms rely on uh, basically on two main tools, at, at least for uh, classes with bonded expansion. And I, I will just say uh, one word about, uh, about those, these tools. The first one is based on the notion of three depths. So the three depths of a graph is uh, the minimum height of a rooted forest such that uh, uh, the graph is a subgraph, the graph G is a subgraph of the, uh, of the closure of my forest, where by closure I mean that I consider my rooted forest and I add uh, all the edges between vertices and their ancestors. So, for instance, in green, uh, on the bottom, I have uh, I have a binary tree, and uh, and I have a very long path, which belongs to the closure of this binary tree. Uh, my path has length which is uh, actually exponential in the uh, in the height of this binary tree, and I cannot actually do better. So, the three depths of a path, actually. Is, uh, is logarithmic in the length of the path. One way to uh, an alternate definition, if you prefer depth of search, is that uh, the three depths of a, of a graph is basically the minimum depth of a depth of search tree that uh, of a super graph of, uh, of my graph. So in particular, uh, by using this, uh, this depth of search, you can prove that uh, a class has bonded three depths if and only if every depth of search tree has bonded height. Uh, one way is because if you have bonded height, of course your graph will be in the closure of your depth of search tree, so you have bonded three depths. On the other hand, if, uh, if you have a, a very, very, very high, uh, very deep depth of search tree, then your graph contains a very long path. You simply consider a root to uh, uh, to leaf path. And if it contains a very long path, it has very it, it has a big uh, a large tree depth. And uh, so classes with bonded tree depths 
are very, very nice. It's, uh, it's, they are almost like finite graphs, uh, that bonded uh, size graphs. They, have, uh, uh, very, they are very simple. And uh, so it's interesting when you have a graph to try to cut it into pieces that have, uh, that have uh, small tree depths. And this is uh, the idea of low tree depth decomposition. The idea of low tree depth decomposition is to color the vertices of your graph into a bonded number of colors, such that if you pick p colors, what is induced by any set by any subset of p colors has three depths at most p. Uh, of course, it's not for all p. So uh, somehow you, it will work for uh, a number of colors which is at most some parameter, and you stop at this point. So the, the main point here is that existence of low tree depth decomposition for every p with a bonded number of colors is characteristic of bonded expansion class. So to say it differently, uh, if you have a class C, then the class has bonded expansion if and only if for every p with a bonded number of colors, you can find a low tree depth decomposition with this parameter p. So such that every p class uh, induce uh, subgraph with three depths at most p. Uh, just to give some uh, intuition of what it means, this decomposition, if you consider p equal to one, um, what does it mean that every one, co uh, every color class induces a subgraph with three depths one? It means that uh, this is a proper coloring. If you take the parameter p equal to two, it means that uh, not only it will be a proper coloring, but any two classes will uh, induce a star forest. And uh, with parameter three, it will be a bit more complicated, but uh, every, uh, uh, every three color will induce uh, some, uh, some subgraph with a small diameter, which will be even uh, series parallel. It will, it will, be, it will, be, uh, it will be small. So as I told, classes with bonded expansion are, the, are characterized by the fact that you have low three depth decomposition with a bonded number of colors. And nowhere dense classes are also defined, are characterized by the property that you have low tree depth decomposition by a small number of colors, where by small I, I mean uh, less than n to epsilon for every epsilon, asymptotically. So some bounds. So uh, I, I gave some uh, theoretical, uh, the fact that it is bonded for bonded expansion, but actually the bonds uh, in, uh, in practical cases are, uh, are kind of nice. So for bonded degree, uh, it increases like uh, the square of the maximum degree and uh, NP, the number of, uh, of the parameter. For outer planar, it grows like P log P. For planar, like uh, P cube log P. And in general, when you exclude the topological, uh, we include the topological clique, it is polynomial in P. Uh, a second tool, uh, which is Im important, is, uh, uh, is uh, variation on the coloring number. So you know that if you have a class, uh, if you have a graph which is degenerate, and by degenerate uh, we mean that uh, every subgraph contains a vertex with small degree, you can see, consider the order obtained by removing one by one the vertices of small degree. And uh, if you consider, so if you remove them one by one and then consider the opposite linear order, you will have the property that every vertex will have a bonded, a small number of neighbors that are smaller. And uh, this order is called uh, uh, degeneracy order or elimination order, and it allows to, uh, for instance, to bond the chromatic number of the graph. Why? Because uh, uh, if you have such an order, it is easy to color your graph. Uh, basically, the first vertex you color as you want, the second vertex you color, and every vertex you will color using a color which is different from its uh, left neighbors, but there are only a, bonded, a small number of them. So by a small number of colors, you will be able to uh, color online your, uh, your graph. So this, this notion of coloring number is, uh, is, is quite important and has been uh, generalized by uh, Kirsten and Young uh, and, uh, and Vojak. 
uh, into three types of parameters, admissibility, strong coloring, and weak coloring. So I will not go into the detail. Uh, this, uh, these parameters are uh, functionally related uh, the one to the others. Uh, simply mention that the weak coloring number, so what is a weak coloring number? You consider a linear order. And for every vertex u, you look at all the vertices v that you can reach uh, from u by a path of length at most r with the property that v has to be the minimum vertex of this path. So you can you start from u, you can go wherever you want to, the, uh, to, to uh, vertices which are smaller or bigger than u, but uh, you can only do uh, this, uh, you, your path is, is short. And the very last vertex has to be the minimum. And the set of vertices that you can reach from u, you call it, uh, the, you say that uh, it is a set of uh, vertices that are weakly are reachable from u. Of course, it depends from the linear order, but uh, what you do is, and the weak coloring number will be the minimum when you consider all possible linear orders of the largest size of a set weakly reachable from some vertex. So if you would consider r equal to 1, it means that uh, you, have only, uh, you can do only one step, and it would be exactly the notion of back degree that we have seen for uh, previously. So the weak coloring number for r equal 1 is simply the coloring number that we are used to. Uh, to, used to. Uh, uh, something which is nice with, weak color, with this weak coloring number, and it's not so difficult to establish, is that if you have two vertices A and B, and you have a short path, a path of length at most D between A and B, so all the, sh the short paths of length at most D have to uh, intersect the intersection of, uh, of the set of vertices which are weakly reachable from A uh, with parameter D, and those which are weakly reachable from B uh, with this parameter d. And why is it so? Because if you consider any pass, the minimum vertex of this pass will be weakly reachable from both a and b for this parameter. So this is some uh, nice property uh, that can be used in, uh, in quite a few algorithms. So again, in practice, so for bonded expansion, these weak coloring numbers are also bonded, and uh, this also characterizes bonded expansion as proved by excluding Zhu in uh, 2009. And, uh, and again, if you exclude some, uh, some complete minor, uh, these numbers uh, increase uh, polynomially. And there, there is, a, okay, in the, in the sequential, uh, realm, uh, you can compute uh, such, uh, so for bonded expansion, you can compute this, uh, some, uh, some nice ordering for weak coloring number or some uh, low three depth decomposition in linear time. And uh, the algorithm uses the so-called transitive fat analog augmentation. So what does it mean? It means that when you have a graph G which is, which is oriented, uh, you can uh, do some transitive augmentation means that uh, when you have a vertex with in incoming arcs and outgoing arcs, you will add, if necessary, uh, the arcs uh, uh, corresponding to the uh, simply uh, joining in neighbors to out neighbors. Uh, only locally, you don't have to, uh, it's, uh, it's not the transitive closure, it's uh, only locally that you do it. And uh, fraternal augmentation means that uh, uh, you add uh, arcs, uh, you have to add arcs when they don't exist uh, between in neighbors, and you can orient them uh, as you wish. Uh, and sometimes there will be some uh, better way to orient them than others. And transitive fraternal augmentation means that you do both. And uh, what happens is that when you have a class with bonded expansion, you can orient you can find an orientation of your graph with bonded in degree, and you can do transitive fraternal augmentation by orienting, uh, in particular, the fraternal uh, uh, edges for which you have some choice in such a way that after doing this, you will still have bonded in, in degree. It will increase, but it will be, uh, still be bonded by some constant depending on the class. 
okay, the theory you can find in the... <laughs> okay, now I, I still have uh, 15 minutes for to, to study uh, maybe something more uh, practical. So what, uh, how this, uh, this notion can be useful uh, in, uh, in distributed computing to do something uh, maybe real. And um, I will consider the, the notion of sub, the, the problem of subgraph detection and enumeration. So basically, subgraph detection means that uh, you have a graph F, uh, F. I will assume that it is connected. You have a graph F, and you want to know whether the graph G contains a copy of F. And uh, it, uh, what you ask is that at the end of the algorithm, uh, if there is a copy of F, so you have at least one vertex that will say, OK, I know that there is a copy of F. And the other, uh, okay, if there is no copy of F, all the vertices have to say no. There is, uh, I, don't, I don't think. Uh, enumeration in the, in the context of distributed computing is something different from uh, the notion of uh, enumeration in the, uh, uh, in the sequential, uh, sequential case. is basically that uh, each time you have a copy, uh, then uh, there should be some vertex that say, OK, I know that there is a copy. Uh, that there is a, I know this copy somehow. Uh, they, uh, every copy should be uh, known by at least one vertex. Usually a vertex which is in the copy. <laughs> so in the local model, in the local model, this problem are not so interesting because, uh, of course, uh, uh, in a small number of rounds, uh, you know everything which is uh, in uh, in the ball of reduce uh, uh, in deep D ones. You know everything which is in the in the uh, uh, in the ball of reduce D around you. So uh, in a number of rounds, which is small, like uh, the number of vertices of F, you know uh, whether there is a copy of F or not. But in the conscious model, things become more difficult. And it, it is so difficult that even for some graphs, the number of rounds that you need is, uh, is almost quadratic, uh, which, uh, which could look strange because your graph is also all, uh, only size n. But uh, because, uh, because of this restriction on the, on the length of the messages that you can uh, spend at each round, at each round, you can, uh, every vertex can only uh, send messages of length uh, log n. Um, even, uh, even cycles, uh, even, even cycles, <laughs> to say uh, things, uh, uh, may need, uh, need uh, square root of n rounds or clicks need square root of n rounds. So, uh, the situation is not so good, but if the graph is sparse, uh, you can do much better. And to explain why it is so, I will go back to the uh, sequential algorithm. So, uh, what happens when you want to find a click in a graph which is degenerate? If you have a graph which is degenerate and you want to, uh, to find or count the number of clicks, uh, there is an idea which goes back to Schrobach and Epstein, which is very simple, is uh, you compute an acyclic orientation of your, of your graph with small out degree. And uh, using uh, the coloring order, so this degeneracy order, you can do it easily. And then uh, first you notice that you can test in constant time whether two vertices are adjacent or not. Because if you have two vertices U and V, uh, they are adjacent if u belongs to the in uh, to the out neighbors of v, and they are only finitely many uh, bound in uh, D, and uh, or uh, v belongs to the out neighbors of of u. So each of the vertices have to test uh, to test uh, uh, d neighbors that they know to check whether it is the over vertex. So in constant time, you can check whether two vertices are uh, adjacent or not. And uh, if you want to test whether uh, you contain your click. Well, if you contain uh, some click of size t, then uh, of course, this click in your graph will, be, uh, will correspond to some, some transitive tournament because uh, your orientation, you are oriented uh, acyclically. And uh, if you consider the vertex, which is uh, uh, the sink of this uh, tournament, uh, everything happens in it. Uh, no, the source. Sorry, because I took uh, some out uh, bonded out degree. So if you take the source of the tournament, all the tournament is in its uh, out neighbors, out neighborhood, 
And this out neighborhood is small. It contains all, uh, at most D vertices. So it simply has to look at all these D vertices and to check whether they are pairwise adjacent or not. And this you can do in constant time. So it allows in particular to enumerate or to count in linear time uh, the clicks in a graph with, uh, which is degenerate. So how to use this ID uh, in the congest model in the distrib for distributed algorithm? So now the first point is uh, how to compute this, uh, this ordering of this orientation, this acyclic orientation. And uh, there is an ID which goes back to Barenboim and uh, Elkin, which was uh, initially for uh, graph with bonded arboricity, but uh, arboricity is not important here. Degenerate graphs, uh, it works the same. And the idea is to iteratively form parts from uh, some set of uh, vertices, V1, VK. So in the first round, you remove, so you consider in V1, you will put all the vertices with degree at most two times one plus epsilon times D. So here I assume that D is known. Uh, if it is not known, there are some way to, to, uh, to, to do it by repeating and uh, simply doubling D or the, each, uh, at each time until it works. Okay, anyway, so assuming that D is known, you can uh, put uh, all the small vertices in V1, then you virtually remove them, so updating uh, the degrees of the vertices, and then uh, you form the set V2, which contains now uh, the, the new small uh, degree vertices, and do it again and again, and uh, you can check that if you, uh, if you remove vertices with degree at most two, two, uh, uh, two times to one plus epsilon times D, where D is the degeneracy of the graph, then actually each time you remove epsilon proportion of all the vertices. So after log n round, or constant time log n round, uh, you, will, uh, you will have finished. So you, uh, uh, you will have uh, uh, removed all the vertices. So the number k, uh, will be something like a constant log n at most. And then you can simply compute your degeneracy order. So a vertex u will be smaller than a vertex v if uh, it has been uh, removed uh, uh, after. Uh, you have to change uh, the order. Or if it has been removed uh, in, the same, in the same process, but its identifier is smaller. Here it is interesting to have this uh, unique identifier. Uh, which allows uh, to check that it will be, uh, uh, to ensure that uh, the orientation will be acyclic, that the, the, tot the order will be total, um, uh, linear, sorry. And, uh, and because every set, uh, in every set, uh, when we remove vertices, we have small degree, uh, uh, you will not find the, the back degree will be at most two times one plus epsilon times D. So it will be bounded by constant time D. So up to some constant, we have some, uh, some order whose by degree is bounded by, uh, okay, constant time degeneracy. And now, how, let, let's apply this. Let's apply this. Uh, oh, but I'm going very fast, actually. Uh, at what time should I stop? You have a lot of time. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I was thinking that uh, uh, I was thinking uh, that I, I stopped at uh, at uh, six. So I no, will have, you have time and I will have infinite. Yes, you can. Yes. I was speaking too fast. Ah, sorry. <laughs> I'm so used to speak fast. So I will. I will go. I will slow down. So coffee and then. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, um, how to use now this uh, this uh, this algorithm? So now we have degenerate graph, and uh, it has been used. Uh, there is a result. Uh, it has uh, it has been proved uh, used to prove that uh, if you want to uh, uh, to enumerate clicks and four cycles, you can do it in uh, log n plus uh, degeneracy ones and five cycles in something which is also uh, about log n. And, uh, and actually, you can extend a bit this result. And uh, 
Uh, okay, uh, I, I don't care too much about the dependency in the degeneracy. I have put some uh, random value, but uh, basically that it, uh, it will be in log n rounds, in big O of log n rounds. And, uh, and you can do this whenever you graph F as a special property. And the special property, which may look strange at first glance, is that whenever you consider any acyclic orientation of your graph, there will exist one vertex that dominates all the things. So if you think about it, it is true in clicks. If you take any uh, orientation, acyclic orientation, of course, uh, any vertex will dominate, dominate all the things. In four cycles, it is also true. Uh, and, uh, and actually, in five cycles, it will be also true. And, uh, and you can find some, uh, some more, uh, okay, this is, a, this is a bit cheating because uh, uh, you will uh, uh, immediately uh, see that this uh, follows from five cycles because it is a, a, a lexicographic product of C5 with K2, but it was just to give some example. If I consider this graph, if I take any acyclic orientation, for instance, this one, in green, I have the things, and in red, I have some vertex which is adjacent to all the things. It could be a sink or, or not. Here it is not even, it is not a sink, it is not a source, it is something else. Okay, so why is it possible? How, how do I do this? So this is in the next slide, but it may, maybe it's easier to, uh, to explain it from, uh, from the figure. What is the algorithm? Well, if I want to find this graph, in the, uh, this, uh, this uh, graph F in my graph uh, G, the first thing that I can do is I will compute my linear order as before. Uh, so I compute an in-degree bounded orientation, uh, uh, which is acyclic in log n rounds. So this is my, and I have my linear order. So I am really, uh, I have my orientation. So I am, I am happy. Now, every vertex will maintain some information about the, the world it knows. And uh, by the world it knows, uh, I will mean uh, it will always know something about uh, a part of the graph which correspond to the vertices that will have a short directed path to the vertex. So in the beginning, I will consider a path of length zero. So every vertex knows its own identifier, so it knows that it belongs to some, uh, it knows that uh, uh, the, uh, this, um, this subgraph of all induced by the vertices which have a path of length zero to, to him. So it's a K1 and it, it knows this K1 perfectly with its the identifier of the node. Okay, nothing to say. But then this information, it will send to uh, all its out, uh, to all its, uh, uh, it will broadcast, and uh, and now uh, if you uh, it will broadcast off of to all its out neighbors. So maybe we, it will say uh, in the first round you will have to uh, to check who is your in neighbor or who is not your out neighbors. But it's okay because you have the linear order. The linear order is known, so you know how to compare two vertices. So basically, we'll send its identifier. And in which part it is, and what is uh, which part it is, and it allows every vertex to know whether uh, a vertex and a neighbor is in neighbor or out neighbor. So I send my ID to my out neighbors, and now when I have a vertex, I will have a new information that I will uh, maintain. So now it is the subgraph induced by myself and my in neighbors. So the vertices that I can, can reach me by a path of length one, directed path of length one. And this information has bounded size because I have bounded in degree. Okay, so next step, I take this information and I broadcast to my out neighbors. So now every vertex will know everything which is, will know uh, the structure of, uh, of the graph somehow like a tree with all the identifiers corresponding to the subgraph uh, induced by all the vertices that can reach, uh, that can reach uh, the, uh, the vertex V with a path of length at most two, and so on and so forth. 
And after f, uh, a number of steps equal to the number of vertices in f, in my, uh, uh, all the things, uh, so if I have a copy of f, then information, uh, which is stored as the things of f, so at this node, so for every vertex, it will know the information corresponding to all the vertices, or in particular of the copy, that can reach a sink. But of course, it is not the information about f, all of f. But uh, somehow you, it's like if uh, every sink has like uh, uh, some tree with depth, uh, whose depth is the number of vertices in f, uh, and for every vertex in the tree, you have the identifier, and some are repeated. So you know that if you would identify, you would know uh, what uh, this, uh, this graph look like. And, uh, and what do we do? At the next last step, you send this information to all your neighbors. And now the vertex, which is universal to the things, will collect in the information that it can collect, it has the information con uh, corresponding to all the things of the copy of F. And from this information, it discovers, oh yes, there is a copy of F. So, um, so to, uh, to, uh, to resume, you have this propagation of information that you send to your old neighbors. In all the steps, uh, it works well because the information you collected is bonded. And in the last step, of the broadcast, the information is not bonded anymore because you can collect from all your neighbors, but you don't care because in this last step, you don't uh, broadcast anymore. You simply decide, is there some a copy of F or not in my neighborhood? Okay, so this is so far so good, but uh, what can we do if, uh, if we have a graph F that does not have this nice property? If we don't have this nice property, then uh, we should uh, try to, uh, to make the graph have this nice property. <laughs> so how to do it? So this was uh, the algorithm. And the magic trick <clears throat> will be to use transitive fraternal augmentation. So, and now, we will rely on some results that I will not uh, formally prove, but I will give you some uh, hint on how it goes, which is that, uh, uh, so if you have a graph G, you can orient your graph in an acyclic way with bonded in degree. So we know how do, to do it in log n rounds. This is uh, uh, the algorithm that I presented, uh, which is Baron, Baron, Baron and Elkin. And, uh, and once you do this, you can, uh, you can compute the transitivity edges and the ASIC, uh, and this uh, uh, fraternity edges. And for these edges, you can again uh, compute some orientation and so on and so forth. So the problem is that the graph, when you augment, you have more and more edges. And uh, so this, uh, this fraternal augmentation, what you do is that you emulate it in G. So, uh, uh, at the same time as you do this, uh, this uh, orientation and augmentation, you maintain the routing, uh, routing information on how to route these edges uh, of the augmented graph within G. And this can be done in a number of rounds, which is uh, still, uh, uh, which is uh, proportional to uh, log n. And actually it is uh, proportional to log n time uh, log n times the number of, uh, so if you do a one step transitive augmentation, you need log n time. If you want to do a P step uh, transitive fraternal augmentation, you can uh, emulate this, uh, this augmented graph and the computation takes P log n time uh, up to some constant uh, rounds, not time. And, uh, as I mentioned before, this transitive fraternal augmentation was used before uh, to compute low three depth colorings, or it can also be used to compute weak coloring orderings. So if you are interested in the tools that I presented in the very beginning, 
you can compute this, uh, this lottery depth coloring uh, or this uh, weak or, or some weak coloring orderings in a time which is uh, basically big O of log uh, in a big O of log n rounds. Um, it can be useful for uh, to implement some uh, some algorithms. So how does it work? I have a graph. This is my network, my my input graph and network. And uh, and first, I compute some uh, uh, acyclic orientation with uh, bounded in degree. And uh, and then I I will assign to uh, to give some information. So in this algorithm that I present, I instead of doing the transitive and fraternal augmentation. I do all the fraternal augmentation first somehow, and I will do the uh, uh, the transitive augmentation last. Why? Because uh, transitive augmentation is easy. You simply have to follow uh, some uh, some links that already exist and uh, a bounded number of them. So you can do it. Uh, the routing is easy. There is no uh, uh, there will be no difficulty. But for the fraternal augmentation, to show what is going on. I start with my orientation and I would put a value one on all the arcs. And uh, this, this value will somehow define a kind of weight or cost of my edge. And what happens in the next step? If I have two edges which are oriented toward some uh, uh, same vertex, I have to add an arc between the two in neighbors and to orient it some way. And this arc, I will give it uh, a cost. And this cost will be the sum of the cost of the two arcs that, uh, that were responsible for its uh, uh, appearance. So here, I will have some arcs with cost two. And I continue with this arc, with, uh, this arc and this arc lead to introduction of this arc, which has cost three. Two plus one, and uh, okay, I do it again and again, and uh, and after a while, uh, I can do uh, uh, here. I would stop after uh, after some time, but uh, I, I could stop after some uh, any number of rounds, and uh, and you see that uh, um, when I have some uh, some arc, let's say here, I have an arc. Uh, with uh, with links uh, uh, with um, with white uh, with weight four, it means that it appeared because of two arcs here of weight two. Each of this came from one 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 one. So it means that I can follow a walk in my graph, which uh, connect my two endpoints, and this walk actually has links, which is the weight of this arc. And this is uh, basically the, uh, uh, the ID, which is used to, uh, to root this, uh, this, uh, the arcs of the augmented graphs. It is that you start from your graph and you blow every vertex. And, uh, and what is interesting is that here, the, this blowing will be bounded. It will be bounded by some function of the class and the number of uh, of uh, steps in the fraternal uh, augmentation you want, and then you will be able to uh, to root every every edge will be rooted as a pass in this uh, in uh, as a short pass, and the length of the pass will be simply the uh, uh, the label the weight that I have put in my uh, in my uh, uh, on my arc, and uh, and this weight cannot be more than uh, two to the number of steps, so it it will be kind of short. But of course, for instance, this uh, uh, the the, uh, the arc from one to ten that adds uh, weight eight. If I follow if I follow the reason of its existence, it will not be completely optimal. Uh, because I will go through v4, v5, then v4 again, and then uh, I will go. I will go here. It will not be optimal, uh, maybe in the sense of the length, but uh, it will allow 
to have a, a nice routing algorithm. So, so the routing uh, will be easier to establish because basically I will route from V1 to V5, then from V5 to V10. So for, I will simply have to remember that for this arc, I need to route first to this vertex, which has been uh, uh, through this vertex, which has been responsible for the appearance of the of the arc. And we, so, and for these two arcs, I will, I will remember that they have to go through uh, some, uh, for instance, this vertex, which was responsible for the appearance, and so on. So it will uh, be a way to decompose the pro the routing problem and to uh, to keep it uh, uh, easily feasible. So the routing algorithm will be uh, uh, will be reasonable, reasonably uh, complicated. Okay. So now, how to apply it? Uh, the main theorem will be that if I have a class with bounded expansion, then I can do subgraph detection in uh, in a number of fronts, which is logarithmic in n. And uh, and following uh, somehow the same strategy or the same algorithm, I will get that for no well dense classes, uh, the algorithm will uh, will use uh, n to epsilon rounds. And uh, so, what is uh, uh, how does it go? It, it will go as follow. The idea is simply uh, it it will use the following lemma that if I do p minus 3 transitive fraternal augmentations to my graph, and if I call g plus this augmented graph, so remember g plus will be emulated on g, I will have some nice routing algorithm which will allow me to, uh, to, uh, uh, to route every edge, uh, to send messages uh, through every edge in constant time. Then in this graph g plus, I will have the property that for every connected subgraph of G with at most P vertices, there will be a vertex adjacent to all the other vertices of H in G plus. So you see the connection with what we said in the beginning when I was looking for my, uh, my, uh, my graph F. Here it will not be that in F I will have uh, in, the, in the pattern that I want to find, I will find a vertex that will be adjacent to all the things, but uh, in my in my uh, supergraph G plus, it will be adjacent to everything. So, because I can use, or I, I will be able to broadcast on my uh, on my uh, uh, on all these uh, uh, these links, I will be able to basically use the same algorithm to recover everything. So let me prove by induction that I have this property. So let me prove that if I do p minus uh, three uh, transitive fraternal augmentation, I have the property that if I take any connected subgraph with p vertices, there is one vertex which is adjacent to every everybody in the augmented graph. So. If p is equal to at most three, it is completely easy because uh, my, if I have a connected graph with at most three vertices, I already have a universal vertex. So assume that I do p minus four transitive fraternal augmentation. So by induction, um, let g star be the graph uh, obtained from g by p minus four transitive fraternal augmentations, and g plus is a graph that I obtain by one more. Now, if I consider my graph, uh, a graph H, which has, uh, which contain, uh, which is connected, and contain p vertices, then it is easily checked that uh, if I have at least three vertices, and uh, I can find two distinct vertices in my connected subgraph H, such that if I remove any of them, what remains is connected. Uh, indeed, because uh, you simply consider some uh, some uh, uh, spanning tree, and in a spanning tree you take uh, two leaves, you have at least two leaves, and uh, uh, these two leaves have this property. So if I remove if I remove uh, u, uh, then I have some universal vertex which will be uh, y. If I remove v, I have some universal vertex in h uh, minus this vertex which I call x. 
And now I have to simply check what happens. It depends. Uh, so I have uh, my, uh, my graph H look like this. I have all the vertices but U and V. I have U, which is connected to at least something, and V, which is connected to at least something in H. And the uh, first case is X is equal to U and Y is equal to V. So it happens that if I remove, uh, if I remove V, then U is universal uh, in G star. And if I remove uh, if I remove V, then U uh, U is universal in uh, in G star. Then it's uh, it's okay because either there exists in G star a, an arc from U to some vertex, and uh, and this vertex will be adjacent to V because V is adjacent to all the vertices uh, in H but uh, but U in, in G star. So uh, in, the in the next step of the transitive fraternal augmentation, U and V will be made adjacent, either by transitivity, if uh, this arc is oriented to, to V, or by fraternity, if both arcs are oriented to this mid-vertex. So this is the first possibility. If, if it is not the case, it means that for every vertex in G minus U minus V, I have an arc in, in G star, I have an arc to U, and I have an arc to V. Both. But then uh, it is easy because I, 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 can, uh, I can consider any vertex in, uh, which is not U and V. And, uh, and you can check that uh, uh, it will be adjacent to everyone in the next step of, uh, of the transitive fraternal augmentation. Because if I take any vertex which is, uh, okay, it is adjacent to U and V, we know it already. And if I take any other vertex in the next step by fraternal augmentation, because I have an arc, uh, both arcs to V, for instance, I will have an arc between the two. So if X equals U and Y equals V, uh, it works. If X is equal to U and Y is different from V, it also works because if I take any vertex, uh, uh, if I take the vertex Y, it is already, uh, it will be already universal. Uh, why? Because uh, uh, by assumption, uh, Y is adjacent to every everything but uh, but U uh, in G star, and U is adjacent to everything but V. So in particular, U is adjacent to Y in G star. So Y is adjacent to everyone. And the last case is that X is not U and Y is not V, and uh, again. Uh, you consider some uh, any uh, uh, you consider x and, and y that be, they belong to, uh, and they have to be adjacent in G star. And if you assume that you have an x from x uh, an arc from x to y in G star, then in the next step, uh, this uh, uh, the vertex x will be universal. Okay. Uh, why do I, uh, did I insist on this uh, in this small lemma? Uh, it's simply because uh, usually when you want, if you would like to use uh, so in the in the sequential case when we find want to find some uh, uh, some subgraph, we use uh, uh, the low three depth decomposition or low three depth colorings. But uh, for the parameter p, which is the size of the graph we, we are looking for. We, uh, usually we use uh, a number of uh, transitive fraternal augmentation which is exponential in p so it's quite long and here it's into and uh, and the the congestion uh, so the degree will increase very fast and it's so for practical reason it's important to uh, to have a number of transitive fraternal augmentation which is as small as possible and here we, uh, we see that the number of transitive fraternal augmentation we need will be not bigger than the number of uh, vertices in, uh, uh, in the graph we want to, uh, we are looking for. Okay, so now I have uh, 25 minutes to speak about, uh, uh, okay, uh, what else? <laughs> so going further, so this case study it was kind of simple. It was simply uh, looking at uh, subgraph detection 
uh, which is a nice problem, but uh, uh, we have seen that the solution uh, is, is not too complex. But we use this transitive fraternal augmentation, uh, and it's not clear how to, uh, to avoid it in general. Uh, to uh, to find uh, to find best subgraph. Even I don't know in uh, in planar graphs if I want to find uh, uh, a cycle of length twenty in a planar graph, uh, can I uh, uh, could I find some uh, some uh, some proof uh, that I can do it in log n steps, uh, log n rounds that will not use transitive fraternal augmentation? It is not completely clear. Um, I can use this transitive fraternal augmentation, as I said, to compute uh, not only uh, low 3 depth uh, decomposition, but also some uh, ordering, which are good for uh, weak coloring numbers. And it has been used in some, uh, in some over algorithm. The first one was used to, uh, to compute uh, distance R dominating sets, so a, a minimum uh, some uh, distance are dominating set. So you want to find a subset of, of nodes such that every, uh, every vertex will be at distance at most r from, uh, from uh, a vertex in the set. And uh, we did it in, uh, in the time which is uh, uh, basically r square log n in the congest model. And uh, if you think about it, even f uh, finding some uh, some uh, dominating set distance are dominating sets in the local model is uh, no longer completely trivial if you want to have it uh, as small as possible and uh, and even if you don't want to uh, it to be as small as possible because of course it would be too difficult but if you want a constant factor approximation uh, it's it was not completely trivial that you can do it in a item bounded number of rounds and it happens that you can do it. You can find a constant factor approximation for this uh, uh, distance R dominating set in the local model in a number of rounds, which is basically three times the distance plus one. And this uses the properties that I mentioned earlier of this uh, uh, weak coloring uh, numbers that uh, if you have a short pass between two vertices, it has to go through this uh, uh, through these vertices, so a small set of vertices which are weakly reachable from both points. Okay. And uh, for, yes? the for the distance r, we still have to do the transitive fraternal augmentation in log n steps, yes, even in yes. the local model? Oh, in the local model, yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. So for distance one, it is by now known. But for distance, for the higher distances, this is still difficult, yes, mm. to get this orientation. But uh, um, oh yes, you you need to find. Uh, oh yes, 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 yes. You're right. You're right. Sorry. Um, Sorry. Mm -hmm. And, and I would like to spend a bit more time on the, on the last problem, which is, uh, uh, which is a, uh, an interesting development, uh, which is what happens, okay, what happens where, when your, your graph is not sparse? So we have seen that uh, if the graph is sparse, if it has bounded expansion, you can do uh, things easily. Uh, but uh, sometimes your graph is not sparse, but it is not sparse for some stupid reason. Uh, for instance, assume that uh, you you consider that uh, you have some uh, network which is formed by uh, uh, by laptops, by computers, uh, laptops that you put uh, there and there uh, in a city, and uh, and two uh, and the, the links are uh, obtained by Wi-Fi. Basically, if you if you are at short D or radio uh, radio uh, connection, so if you have at small distance, basically you can you are connected. Of course, your your graph can be uh, quite dense. Uh, it it can be quite dense uh, because uh, it is uh, basically the power of a sparse graph. 
you have a sparse graph which is coming of a skeleton somehow, uh, uh, and uh, you say everything which is at distance at most d in this sparse graph is connected to me. Okay. So now the question is uh, now you have a, a question which is not completely easy. You have uh, you have this uh, this dense graph, and uh, in the congest model. You would like uh, you would like to uh, uh, to be able to uh, to do effectively some uh, uh, to have some effective algorithm, and one way to do it, for instance, would be to say, okay, I have many neighbors, but maybe I can find a way to elect to to to, to, to do some election to 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 select uh, special neighbors uh, in, in in some sense to retrieve a sparse network, so to emulate a sparse network in this dense network in such a way that uh, even if I want to discuss, I will not discuss with all my neighbors, I will always simply discuss with a bounded number of them. Uh, I, I could again find some sparse network and uh, which would be degenerate and on it I will be able to, uh, uh, to find some ordering uh, some acyclic orientation of these edges, the over edges I don't care, and uh, because uh, basically I can define this adjacency uh, uh, from my sparse network and use my sparse network to do the computation. And, uh, and the idea which is behind was that, okay, in the beginning we have seen that to solve the problem of detecting a subgraph, it was interesting to emulate a communication network which was which, that was denser uh, because we are missing some links, and these links we could uh, emulate uh, with uh, with low cost. But now, if we have a dense network, maybe it's the opposite. What you would like is to emulate in it a communication network which would be sparser, but sufficiently sparse so that we can again uh, orient our edges and elect some uh, some in neighbors. Uh, and to have only a bounded number of them, and to be able to find our way uh, using some, uh, uh, some in an easy way, let's say. Okay, so this leads, leads me with uh, uh, maybe a quarter of hour for, uh, for questions and, uh, and coffee break. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this great talk. Are there questions? I think that every everyone wants to have a coffee. <laughs> Actually, I have a question and I discussed it a little bit first. Like, uh, suppose this very simple scenario that you have a... Uh, okay, it's not exactly related to the talk. Uh, uh, we have like a tree plus one extra edge, and this is our input graph, and all nodes know that. And of course, we can in log n time, we can find the orientation and uh, detect if there is a small cycle. A small, I mean, constant length cycle. But uh, can we do that in constant time? Like, let's say, gears of this graph is G. Can we do it in O of G? It has at most one cycle. It's very simple. So actually, the reason I thought about this is that I'm thinking about erdos rheny graphs. And they have few, they have a small, um, a few cycles of a small, uh, few small cycles. And the rest are big. Mm. So uh, then, if you want to design some algorithms uh, like Ponson run algorithm in such graphs, it's enough to oh, resolve the think... problem with those uh, small cycles, and then big cycles are not important because it's like three like structure that is. So I know there are some results about uh, finding some uh, uh, somehow the girls uh, determining the girls of a graph in, uh, in the conscious model, but I, I am not that. Uh, uh, I don't remember exactly what was the uh, uh, what was the result. Um, mm, 
Let's see. Hmm. Oh, to detect. Uh, Circle of length for length three is easy, right? You just orient from smaller ID to bigger ID, for example, and everyone informs its parents who are its parents, and we will find the cycle of length three easily. One of the parents will detect. But cycle of length four, I thought a little bit that didn't come. I don't know. It's a <laughs> this is this is a good question. <laughs> um, How can you find your cycle? Uh, I suspect it probably should be hard, but I'm not entirely sure now. Like, like, like computing four. curves should be hard in congest. Yeah, but uh, this is very simple. Graph. Yes. But Maybe I can, yeah. I can just have a look. So, so do you like? What notion of simplicity? Like for uh, degenerate, like bounded degeneracy graphs, if you have degeneracy two, uh, like detecting six cycles is still hard. Uh, the, this is uh, the, the example that I'm saying is very simple. Yes, I mean, you have a three plus one extract. Right. Right. It's not uh, because the one that you see, you can construct a key code of it after by some contraction. But... Oh, uh, yes. I see, there is some result uh, uh, about uh, fast uh, distributed algorithm for GERS cycles and small graphs in, uh, in the congest model. Uh, is there is, there, is, there, is there is, oh, how is it? There are just negative points about it, but Yana knows better in, in this course. Is there, is there is some algorithm which has have the additive plus one approximation? Yeah, I don't remember off the top of my head, like what's the complexity of girth, but... Um... Uh, it is constant time algorithm. Right. But, uh, constant. Uh, which graphs? Uh, this is it's too strange. Uh, <laughs> ah, what is say? So it it is a. It is in in the congested click model. It is not in the congested model. It is a bit different. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yes, in congest, uh, in congest, uh, they can find girls with time complexity. Oh, it's big. It's uh, it's something like n to one minus one over the girls, or constant of one one minus one over constant times the girls, something like this. So uh, it's kind of close to uh, to n. Uh, to linear, it's a bit small, be, better than linear, but uh, when the girls goes to infinity, it goes to linear. I think that uh, basically the difficulty are, uh, from what I understood, are even cycles. Are there further yes, questions? Yeah, yes, because even to check whether you don't contain a C6 square root of n, something like this. So, uh... <laughs> yeah, that's true. But um, okay, my point was that I'm talking about very very simple graphs. Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, if you have something which is unicyclic, maybe it's uh, it's more more easy. Uh, but of course, we now we know that uh, if you are unicyclic. Uh, then uh, you can first uh, compute some uh, some nice orientation in log n steps and uh, uh, yeah, of course log n step yeah, uh, even if you have more than that, you can find it. Yes, I mean um, perhaps not a 
the, the, you can you cannot find large circuits, but at least a small circuit should be good. Yeah, like something like length of the cycle should be doable. Like you yeah. just propagate yeah, so to every direction. The in log n steps, it works somehow. You remove all the vertices of degree one, and you do it uh, log n steps, and you end with a cycle. <sighs> Basically, it's not completely exact, but uh, it's uh, somehow something like this. Yeah, I agree. If you have some orientation, mm -hmm. yeah. Basically. Are there further questions? Okay, so coffee break. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yes, yes, thank you, thank you, Patrice. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. <sighs> Sorry for for having starting so uh, so fast. I was uh, somehow misleaded by. <sighs> oh, it was still no, it's fine. good to follow. Okay, great. So we have a break and meet again at 6.30. Right.